students here, a lot of visitors to the campus, so uh, we're glad that you're here this evening. Uh, for those who do not know me, I'm Dr. Zola, I'm Chairperson of Philosophy and Religious Studies and Director of the Catholic and Dominican Institute. And we're very happy to have Father Nikonor with us here this evening for his talk on um, defending Adam after Darwin. And um, it's, it's sort of interesting how Providence works. Um, I uh, receive uh, the CARA report, and CARA is the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate that's published out of Georgetown University. And in their winter edition 2018, the, the um, center does a lot of research in terms of um, Catholics in the United States of America, demographics, etc. And this uh, edition, winter of 2018, was Catholic Attitudes on Faith and Science. And so Father's uh, talk with us tonight speaks so well to um, our Division of Natural Sciences, the School of Nursing, Father's uh, um, expert in biomedical ethics, as well as uh, philosophy and religious studies. And so I won't bore you to tears with the research of, of the report itself, but I'll get right to the conclusion. And these were the two conclusions that uh, the center had made about at least Catholics in the United States of America and their relationship to science. Uh, the first is, the church has not catechized Catholics well concerning how science and faith intersect. A plurality of Catholics, for example, have no opinion about how the Big Bang Theory and their faith do or do not conflict. Even more tellingly, six-tenths of those who see the two as compatible believe the Catholic Church does not teach that they are compatible. Uh, second, a wide range of opinions among Catholics reflects the diversity of Catholics' opinions about the proper relationship Christians should have to the Bible, with one in five Catholics believing that the Bible is to be taken literally, word for word. Not being aware of the Church's teaching on the Bible may play a role in their conflicting feelings, especially on matters related to the origins of the universe and life on earth. So um, it is very apropos Father's topic with us uh, this evening. So who is Father Nikonor? Father completed his bachelor's degree in bioengineering summa cum laude at the University of Pennsylvania and then earned his PhD in biology from MIT in the laboratory of Professor Leon <coughs> Garante where he was a fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He was ordained a priest for the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, in May of 2004. Father then completed his pontifical license in sacred theology, in moral theology, summa cum laude, at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. in 2005, and a pontifical doctorate in sacred theology, magna cum laude, at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland in 2015. Father currently serves as a professor of biology and a professor of theology at Providence College in Rhode Island. His NIH-funded laboratory at Providence College is investigating the genetics of programmed cell death using yeast as model organisms. His research has been published in several leading scientific journals, including Microbial Cell, Cell, the Journal of Cell Biology, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the USA. In philosophy and theology, his essays have been published in many leading journals, such as the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly, Theological Studies, Nova et Vitera, The Thomist, and Science and Theology. His first book, Biomedicine and Beatitude, An Introduction to Catholic Bioethics, was published by Catholic University Press in 2011, and in 2012, Choice chose it as their outstanding academic title by the Association of College and Research Libraries. So this is Father Nikonor's first visit with us here. I hope it won't be his last. And a warm Mount St. Mary welcome for Father Nikonor. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand over here if you don't mind because I need to, to address and look at the slides. But thank you to Dr. Zola for the kind invitation. I've had a full and wonderful day here at the Mount. But what I'd like to do actually is to begin this lecture with a prayer that I begin all my classes with at Providence College. And it's the prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas that has been abridged. It's the prayer, and I don't know if you realize, a lot of people don't realize that Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican. He has an OP after his name, just like I have an OP after mine. And this is the Dominican institution. You have Aquinas Hall. So I thought I'd begin with that same prayer. This is the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who made of all things, true source of light and wisdom, graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Give me a keen intellect, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Give me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. 
Going down to beginning, direct the progress and perfect my work. We ask you this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 You know, when I when I first began my tenure as a professor at, at Providence College, I, I decided I wanted to start my classes with this prayer. And I wasn't quite sure exactly how people would react to that. But it's interesting because like a month and a half into class, I had two of my freshmen women come to me because it turns out the day before, one of them had to be transported to the emergency room at Fatima Hospital, which is our local hospital. And they were telling me how when they were in the ER, they knew they had to pray, but they didn't know what prayer to say. But since we've been praying this prayer practically every other day for, like at that point, a month and a half, they decided they were going to pray the prayer before study in the ER. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know if that was okay. And I said, I'm sure God understood a prayer is a prayer, but I also suggested to them that the Our Father would have probably been an, another appropriate prayer for them. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we should have done that too. So um, that's why I start my classes with this prayer. And I, it's, it, I, I started with this, with this prayer because I'm going to rely on the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas as we talk about evolution. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas died about 800 years ago. And yet his thought was so illuminating, so clear, that it can help us today think through some of the challenges that we face as we bring together the very best of science and the very best of theology into a, into a coherent account of reality that hopefully will lead us to God, who calls us to himself. And so I'm going to just begin by highlighting the problem by citing a couple of theologians. So this is Father Jack Mahoney, who's a Jesuit, now retired at Boston College. And he says this, I argue that with the acceptance of the evolutionary origin of humanity, there is no longer a need or a place in, in Christian beliefs for the traditional doctrines of original sin, the fall, and human concupiscence resulting from that sin. So there's that view. There's, uh, this is John Hopp, who's a theologian at Georgetown. He says, evolutionary science has rendered the original cosmic perfection one allegedly debauched by temporally original sin, obsolete and unbelievable. So these are two Catholic theologians in the United States, and they're, they're basically arguing this. And if you, if you ask them why, they're going to point to two reasons based on evolutionary theory. They're going to say that evolution has, evolu evolutionary theory has shown that there was no such thing as an idyllic Eden. Death has always been in the world. Second, they're going to point out that the very best biology, and we're going to review some of that data today, points out that our species never shrunk to two. The smallest size it's ever been is between about 5,000 and 10,000 individuals. And so they're going to say, in light of this science, how can we hold to this account of, of, of the origins of our kind? That's really the problem. Now, the problem is particularly challenging if you're a Catholic Christian, because the Council of Trent, in its fifth session in 1546, in the decree concerning original sin, basically says that the account of the fall and the account of original sin is an integral part of the Catholic faith. It's not something you simply can get rid of. It's like saying Jesus is God. We will never be able to say Jesus was not God without inherently contradicting what God wanted to say about himself. And so 500 years ago, you have this statement. And so now, as a Catholic Christian, as Christians, because I have to work with evangelical Protestants who face the same problem. How do you bring into conversation evolutionary theory and the revelation of God that you see particularly in sacred scripture? And so this is what we're going to talk about today. How do you deal with the historicity of Adam and Eve? And I'm going to, this talk is going to be divided into four questions. I'm going to begin by talking about God and evolution, because a lot of people just don't get how God could work through evolution. So I'm going to go through that. And this is going to be a little bit philosophical, but I hope that you'll be able to grasp the main outlines of what a philosophy of evolution would look like. We're then going to do some biology. We're going to do some science. What do we know about the origins of our species 
based on the best science we have today. Then we're going to talk about theology. So we had philosophy, we're going to do some science, then we're going to do some theology, where the theology here is, what does the Catholic Church teach about the origins of our kind, of our species? And then finally, we're going to do some creative thinking. How do you bring this all together in a creative way that keeps the truth parts of apparently conflicting views in harmony with each other? So I'm going to begin now with how and why God created through evolution. So this is a how question. And I'm going to begin this way. St. Thomas will begin this way. He says, if you want to understand how God works, you have to begin with looking at how creatures work. Because we are surrounded by creatures, and so we are most familiar with creatures. So if we can't see God, we can at least see each other. We can see dogs, cats, whales, and lions. And we can look at those things, and we can try to figure out how those things work, and then try to see how the very best philosophical reasoning would challenge us to expand that account of action to God himself. So when we look at creatures, if we look around at how things work today, we discover that they act primarily by moving matter from one place to the other. So right now I'm moving back and forth, that's an action, and I'm moving my matter from one place to the other. And you see, for the most part, that's what we think about when we think about action. And so when we imagine actors and actions in the world, we think of forces interacting with matter. I push you, you push me back. And so everything that we see in the world is about pushing and pulling of some sort or the other. Now it's interesting, if I ask then how does God act, not surprisingly, many of us will be tempted to think that God acts in the way that you and I act. He's just a bigger force pushing a bigger stuff from one place to the other. And this is where Thomas Aquinas gives us a hint of how to think through this apparently mysterious question. And he's going to say, is God similar or different to us? Right? And we're going to say he's different. And I'm going to simplify a lot of Aquinas in this one slide, he says, the creator, that is God, is very, very, very different from us, his creatures, because he is a verb and we are nouns. Okay? That's very simply put. My students go, what? When I tell them this, I say, Thomas will say that God is a verb. He is a living verb. We are living nouns. That's why there's so much difference between God and us. And you go, where does he get this idea? He gets this idea from a couple of places. So this is where, now it's not just any verb. It's not running or swimming or sleeping. Those are verbs. He says God is being. That's, that's the verb that God is. No one is ever going to say that Dr. Zola is being. But when we talk about God, Thomas will say that the best description of God is he is being. Now where does Thomas get this? He gets this from sound philosophical argument, which I have no time to get into. But he also gets it from the Bible. Because here's Exodus 3.14. For those of you who may not be familiar with the story, here's Moses. And there's the burning bush. And Moses goes, what's your name? And what does God say? I am who am, translated Yahweh. <clears throat> but here's the thing, I am who am, more properly speaking is, I am ising, where is is the verb, and it's a co continuous progressive. God is saying, I am the being, I am the ising, I am a verb. He is about existing. And so when Aquinas, St. Thomas, looks at this question, he says, you and I are radically different from God because he is a verb. He is the very act of existing. And we actually are nouns, number one, and our existing depends upon him. We're going to see this in a moment. So we'll say, if he is different, if he is a verb and we are nouns, then we should expect that how he acts should be very different 
from the way that you and I act. Because verbs don't act the same way as nouns. So, he acts by giving existence to matter and to forces. You see, if we look at how we act, we are matter, and we act by giving or receiving forces. God transcends that. He actually gives matter, he gives forces their existence. And when I, when I, when I explain this to my students, I have to point out that we don't usually think this way because we live in a material world and many of us are not trained to think what is called <laughs> metaphysically. So if I look at Dr. Zola right now and I say, look, why does he exist? And that's the kind of question St. Thomas is going to ask. You will be like, how do I answer that question? So if I ask him, why, why is he awake? You see, you can say, well, he is awake because he is keeping himself awake. You see that? And if I get boring, he'll decide to give up and he will <laughs> stop keeping himself awake and he'll fall asleep. So being awake versus being asleep is something that you can control. It's something, it's a power <coughs> that you and I have. But if I ask, why is he existing? Now, I'm not saying, why is he alive? Because when we think alive, what's the opposite of alive? Dead. Dead. What's the opposite of existing? Non-existing. Non Annihilation, as in not even here. If I say, all right, why is he existing? He can say, well, I'm keeping myself in existing because I can say, all right, turn yourself off. And he can't, right? If I ask any of you, all right, stop existing, you won't even know how to do that. It's like some people, like, they go, I'm going to move my ear. I have no idea how to move my ear. And yet my, some of my students, they just go, do something, and the ear starts to move. I don't even know how to move my ear. In the same way, if you reflect upon yourself, there is no way you know how you keep yourself into existence. And so Aquinas will say, this is because it's not in your power. You don't have that power. So if I ask you, why then don't you disappear? Because someone, something, is giving you existence to keep you in existence. And this something is called the first cause. This something is called God. So God acts by giving existence to matter as particular kinds of things with specific natures. And one of my students, I will never forget, he, he, when we were discussing this, he said, Oh my goodness, I'm God's imaginary friend. <laughs> and he's absolutely correct. When you and I have imaginary friends, we don't have the power to give them existence. We can imagine them, but we can't make them really real. But when God imagines us, he is able to give us the real, real existence that we could never give to the imaginary friends that we think about. And this is deeply consoling, actually, because sometimes my students will go, I, don't, I think God has forgotten me. And I say, look at the mirror. Are you there? Yeah. Well, if you're there, he's still thinking of you. Because if he stops thinking of you, you're going to disappear. Because he needs to keep thinking about you all through your entire life to keep you in existence. In the same way that if you were J.K. Rowling and you were imagining well, the entire wizardry world, <laughs> when you stop thinking because you fell asleep, in a sense, that world disappeared. Yeah, she had to keep thinking about it. And in the same way, we, creation is God thinking us into existence. It's not just about the Big Bang happening 13.8 billion years ago. He keeps us into existence then, and he keeps us into exist in existence now. He continues to think with us. Now, now, how does God do this? How does God work in and through you this way? I use this analogy, an author writing a note with a pen. And if I ask, who wrote the pen? You're going to say, the author, right? But the pen wrote the note too. Both the author and the pen. If, the, if you took the pen from the author, could he write? No. no. If you took the author from the pen, could the pen write? No. Now, they're both writing together. 
And they're both writing completely, totally with each other. It's 100% pen and 100% author. And in fact, what is striking is that we can say this, the author and the pen were needed to write. The, pen, the author is called the principal cause and the pen is the instrumental cause. Now notice, right, the note has characteristics of both the author and the pen. It has the author's handwriting and the pen's ink color. So it's deeply together. You can't separate one from the other. Both are working together in order to realize the note. Does anyone understand that? That's how we are going to think about how God works in and through us to do what he does in the world. So the pen is not really a pen until the author uses it to write. And without an author, a pen cannot really be a pen. I take my pen and I go, I can shove it up my nose to remove a booger. I could go ahead and use it to shove a door open as a doorstop. But properly speaking, it's not a pen then. Right? It's a booger remover and it's a doorstop. Properly speaking, the pen is only a pen when someone is using it to write. So this, and, it, and I want you to understand how for 2,000 years, Christians have imagined themselves in that way. I am a pen, and God is using me to write the story of my life. Now you notice, it's not me or God, it's me and God working together. The great Saint Mother Teresa would explain that at the end of her life, she imagined herself to be like a little groom. God would take it out so every so often, groom at, you know, remove some of the dirt, and then he'd leave the broom in the corner of the, of the room, and she'd be okay with that. And God would use her in that way. Now, I want you to think about a rose bush. Is God working when the rose bush blooms? This is really interesting, because this is biology, and we usually don't think about how God works, but I'm going to show you that God works in and through the rose bush. All right? So you look at this. When a rose bush blooms, the rose that did not exist comes into existence, right? There was, two weeks ago there was no rose, today there's a rose. So that rose exists now. Now, the rose bush cannot give existence to the rose. I told you, you can't give existence to yourself. Let alone a rose bush giving existence to itself. So the rose bush must receive its existence from the first cause who is God. So, how do we there? God has to act when the rose bush is blooming. And as spring arrives, you'll go out and see God working with and through all of the dandelion lions that are about to bloom. Now here's the thing. So God creates the bush, we know that. He gives the rose bush the rose bush nature, and then he acts with the rose bush so that it can bloom a rose. He's doing all of these things together with the rose bush. Now notice, the rose bush is an instrumental cause and God is the principal cause. This is the pen, there is the author. And just like in the handwriting, both God and the rose bush are acting together. So you see this, the rose has characteristics both from God and the rose bush. It is existing because of God, it is the rose because of the rose bush, both working together, intimately. You say, well which one is it? Is it the rose bush or God? You go, no, it's both. Both are working together to generate the rose. Now, God gives creatures their existing, he gives creatures their natures, and he acts with creatures. Now, this, this applies to us too, okay? So, I want you to think about a pineapple, right? Think about a pineapple. Are you thinking about a pineapple? Now, notice, three seconds ago, that pineapple didn't ex thought of a pineapple didn't exist, right? So, the pineapple thought now exists when you're thinking about it. So God had to work there too. So you gave the thought the pineapple form, and he gave that thought its existence. And just like the rose bush and God work together to give the rose, whenever you're thinking any thought, anything that exists, God is giving the existence to that thought. This is why God knows everything. Because once something exists, it cannot exist without him thinking about it. And if he thinks about it, he knows it. Like you know all the thoughts in your head. 
That's actually what defines the thoughts in your head. So if God, God's thinking gives rise to everything that exists, there is nothing that exists that is outside his knowledge. This is why we say God knows everything. Now you see, when you realize that God gives his creatures natures that are dynamic, they're constantly changing. Rose bushes are living, they're dying, they're blooming, they're not blooming. Evolution is an account of how God working with creatures interact in a living world. See, a lot of people assume that evolution is just there and God is there. What I want you to see and realize is that evolution is God working with his creatures. There is never a moment in evolution where God is not working. In the same way we say there is no moment in human history where God ceased to work. Because every time something happened, something it only happened because it now has existence. And so God, who is existence, who is being, is able to give that thing its existence. Now, we see this. This is the International Theological Commission, which is the committee of the best theologians of the Catholic Church. They met um, in 2004 with this great document called Communion and Stewardship, chaired by then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, who would then, in a few years, be elected Pope Benedict XVI, and he talks about, in this paragraph, they talk about what you, what you and I just discussed, about how God works through evolution in order to create. So we can say things like this, God creates through evolution, God designs through chance. These are things that, if you do not have a deep understanding of who God is, you will see it will appear to you to be contradictory. Because when we do this, we can't design through chance. But that's because we're nouns. God is a verb. And so he's able to do things, incredible things, that you and I can't even imagine doing. Now we have to talk about this. Why does God create through evolution? So a lot of my, my students will say, well, couldn't he have just created things via an act of special creation? Okay, I'm going to have a dog. Boom, there's a dog. There's a cat, there's a coyote, there's an uh, alligator. We're going to just create them all. Why did he choose to create through evolution? And I'm going to make arguments that I'm borrowing from, the, from Thomas Aquinas. And I'm updating them 800 years to give you some sense for why God created this way. So we'll talk about, so Thomas writes this really cool book called the Summa Theologiae. It's cool, but it's incredibly dense. It takes one of those books that would take you a long time to read and grasp. It take, it's a book that you have to pray through. He asked this question, why does God give, so, um, he asked this very question, why doesn't God do everything himself? Why does he have angels go talk to Mary? Why does he have angels go talk to the shepherds on the Christmas morning? Why can't he just do everything himself? And what Thomas Aquinas says is this. If God governed alone, if he did everything by himself, things would be deprived of the perfection of causality, wherefore all that is affected by many would not be accomplished by one. My students go, what the heck was that? <laughs> How do you translate that into English? And the way I do that is this, right? Give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Now, you and I can write a book, but we cannot make a book that writes itself. Because the power to give power is something we don't have. And so, Thomas Aquinas will say that it's actually more amazing that God taught us to be teachers rather than just to teach us all the way through. And so we would say that evolution is a way that he's able to give his creatures the powers that only he could share, and that is the power to create. That's one reason. The second reason has to deal with this. Thomas Aquinas will say, 
why did God create many, many things? Why not just one thing? Why did he have to make butterflies and lizards and snakes and giant sequoias? Why did he make all of this stuff? Why did he just make angels? Because there were a lot of people who said, well, angels are beautiful, angels are perfect. Why did he waste his time making us? Why did he waste his time, God waste his, his time making rocks and fish? And Thomas will say this, For God brought things in being in order that his goodness might be communicated to creatures and be represented by them, and because his goodness could not be adequately represented by one creature alone, he produced many and diverse creatures. Again, let me translate that for you. If you wanted to understand a painter, would you choose to look at one of his paintings or visit his entire gallery? Which one? If you wanted to understand a painter. The gallery. Why is that? Because each painting reflects a little bit of him. If you only had one painting, if you only had one still life, you wouldn't realize <coughs> that he had a fascinating for landscapes. The Hudson Valley was so amazing to him that he painted 12, 12 in a series throughout the different seasons. You didn't realize that he also enjoyed doing portraits. So you have to have a gallery of paintings in order to better understand who the painter is. And Aquinas says this, Thomas will say this, God is a painter. If he only painted one thing, you'd think that's all he could do. So he did a whole bunch of things because he is the most amazing God. He can do an infinite number of things, so that's what he did, right? So here's the thing, right? Because of evolution, oh, over a three billion year period, he could make, we approximate, four billion species of life. Four billion portraits spread out over three billion years. That's evolution. There's only about eight million today. So if God wanted to make an entire as many paintings as possible, and he had a very limited gallery, he had to make sure that he made them in such a way that he could cycle through the gallery. So at some points and early parts of the history, he had the reptiles and he had the dinosaurs, and then they went out and he put in a new exhibit called mammals. And that's where we end right now, right? And of course, we are the, 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 the epitome of that. Now, it's also interesting because some paintings are incompatible in the gallery. You can never have a T-Rex and an African elephant on the same planet. One will eat the other, and it is not the elephant eating the T-Rex. <laughs> so if you want to have a T-Rex on the planet and an elephant on the planet, you have to separate them by time. Do you understand? And so this is one way you can understand how evolution reveals God's glory because he is able to show so many more species and we are and there, some of these species are incompatible with each other in the ecological niche so he has to kind of vary it through history in order to get them all together at the same time and this is how I imagine it it's an entire portrait gallery spread out over time where each one of these paintings is a biological species okay that's the philosophy. Let's move to biology. So what does genomic science tell us about our species? Let's go through a couple of and biological. This, I used this slide, this, this slide earlier today in a lecture to the nursing students. This is a human genome. This is defined the human genome. It's all the genetic information of a particular species. And it's split up usually between two parts. The nuclear genome, these are all the chromosomes. And then you've got this little genome called the mitochondrial genome. And when I ask the nursing students in this room, they're like, energy production, absolutely correct. Now, if you take one of these chromosomes and you stretch them out, you get the very famous DNA molecules, double helical. But what a lot of people don't realize who are not biologists is that you can convert the information in this double helix into letters. And so this is a part of a genome. So this is what a DNA looks like. It's a pattern of GATC. This is, in fact, the gene 
that my students and I have been working on for seven years. This is the gene we discovered and we've been characterizing, BAX inhibitor. This is our gene, it's very cool. I like it. You might not realize how cool it is, but it's very cool. And one of the things is you get to read DNA like you read English. So an English sentence begins with a capital letter, a gene begins with a triplet ATG, and uh, every gene begins pretty much with an ATG, just like an English sentence begins with a capital, and an English sentence ends with a period, you have a stop codon, usually TAA, sometimes TGA. So if you knew the code, you could actually read this. It's a C, it's information. So here's the thing, biologists can compare and contrast genomes. We can take this word and that word and we can compare them. We can compare text, that's what we do. And here's the thing, I want you to think about 10 final exams with similar answers, right? What does this tell you among the relationships among them? So if you were a student or professor, if you saw 10 exams and they were identically the same, what would you say? Cheating, that's called common origin, right? So cheating is common origin. I look at these exams, they're similar, and I go, they have to have a common origin. So what we've done is we look at genomes and we compare them, and they're incredibly similar. And so when they're incredibly similar, we say, common origin. Someone cheated, one species cheated from the other, borrowed the answer. That's stretching the analogy, but but here's the thing. So here's the DNA for cows, deers, whales, hippos, pigs, peccaries, wild boar, abel, and an outgroup. We don't have to talk about that. I want you to notice that these, this is the gene for, a, for casein beta, which is the most common protein in cow's milk. Now you notice that the letters at certain positions are the same. Do you see that? And we can then figure out who copied from whom. And we can put the relationships together. So one thing that surprises, this is a whale, the closest relative to the whale, if you look at comparing their genomes, comparing their exams, is the hippo. Very surprising until you realize that the hippo and the whale share a common ancestor. And the pig and the peccary cow and the deer. So what you do is that more closely related genomes have a more recent common ancestor. They cheated in particular ways. We can figure out the patterns of the cheating. We can also use the differences in similarities and answers to figure out who copied from whom. Think about it this way. I have exam one and exam two and exam three. Exam one and exam two have one answer in common. Exam one and exam three have all 10 answers in common, all right? Can you tell me something about who copied from whom and who copied from whom later or earlier in the writing of the exam? You would probably say that one and three because they are exactly the same. The copying had to have happened late in the exam process because one of them had to have written all 10 answers before the second, the third guy copied the answer. While here you only have one answer in common, and so if there was copying, and they, they copied everything, you would say one and two, two copied one only when one had written the first answer because if the rest of the answers were not there, otherwise he would have copied it. And so you can look at these patterns and we can figure out the relationships between the two and we get this. So we know that chimpanzees and humans have a common ancestor six million years ago and that these two have a common ancestor with gorillas 10 million years ago by the copying principle. We can also take just the human lineage and we can spread that out. It turns out this is us, modern humans. We have a common ancestor about half a million years ago with Neanderthals, now extinct, and a million years ago with another extinct hominin species called Denisovians. One more time we can take modern humans and it turns out that modern humans, so here it is, Europeans, Asians, and Melanesians have a common ancestry with Africans about 100,000 years ago. <coughs> All human beings are descended from the same root. 
And the common account is this. So our species evolved in Africa, somewhere in East, South, Southeast Africa. And over historical time, people basically walked out of Africa and populated the rest of the planet. So the population of the Americas took out about 14,000 years ago. And we know this because of the cultural artifacts that they left behind. We, at this point, there was also an ice bridge in the Bering Strait, so people could actually walk across, which is why Native American Indians look more like Asians than anyone else, because their ancestral roots come from the Mongolian, so they have roots there. Now, so the first scientific consensus biologically is modern humans had a common origin about 200,000 100,000 years ago, they dispersed from Africa about 60,000 years ago. There was a giant volcanic explosion in Toba 74,000 years ago, and we think that led to climate change and a whole thing, a lot of things happened. People started walking because they weren't quite, the weather, the, the climate had changed. Second, how many mating pairs 65,000 years ago would explain the genetic diversity we see today? Remember I pointed out, scientists calculate there's about 5,000 to 10,000 original people. How do you do that? You do it this way. All right, if I look at this pedigree, here's Daddy Beagle and Mommy Beagle, and there's all the baby beagles. I say, does this pedigree make sense? Yeah, but if I do this, you go, this doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. You know, you know by looking at this, that it had to be at least this. So what you can do is you can look at today and work your way back to figure mm -hmm. out how many original pairs must have been to explain what you see today. So maybe you don't know this, but knowing this, I can use reason to do, I can do this kind of calculation. And so biologists have done that. It's about 1,000 to 2,000 mating pairs, so 4,000, 10,000. That number is about in the, in the thousands in Africa. That's like the smallest number you need to explain the genetic diversity that we have on the population, on, in the, on the planet today. Do you see how they did that? It's like that pedigree thing. It's a lot more sophisticated. You have to do computer modeling and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, that's the kind of reasoning that they did. The third scientific consensus is there was interbreeding between the Neanderthals and Denisovans. So if you are descended from an ethnic group outside Africa, approximately 4% of your DNA comes from Neanderthals. And the Neanderthal genes are primarily genes involved in the immune system, fighting off bugs, which makes sense, right? You would keep the genes that help you be more fit now, if you, if you were someone of Melanesian descent, you would not only have Neanderthal genes, you would have Denisovan genes. So if any of you here is descended from the Maori in New Zealand, um, the Aboriginal tribes in Australia, then you would have a certain percentage of your DNA from Denisovians. So we know this. We can, we can look it up. I looked it up. I had my genes. I have like 4% Neanderthal. And pretty much, you can all do the same. Send your DNA off to 23andMe to tell you what percentage of your genome is Neanderthal. All right, so here's the second question of the four. We evolve from non-human creatures. We can trace our origins to a small population of individuals in Africa. And they interbred with a whole bunch of these uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans after they had migrated out of Africa. So that's part number two. That's a science. Let's do theology. What is the Catholic Church? How has the Catholic Church looked at this question over the past 2,000 years? So whenever I give this talk, people talk about Humani Generis. So Humani Generis is a document, a Catholic Church document, written by Pius XII, who was Pope. This is now 1950, so we're dealing with 68 years ago. And in paragraph 37, he will say this, For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take part, do not take their origin through natural generation from him as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. So a lot of people say, look, the church has spoken. At the end of the day, there was Adam, there was Eve. 
Now what's really interesting is they don't usually look at the next <laughs> sentence. The next sentence gives the reason for why Pius XII, the Holy Father, said what he said. He said, because we don't know right now how we could take, how we could reconcile any other account of human origins with the church's teaching on original sin. Now, you, you, you have to understand, when, when I read a document like this, I've got to go, what was he thinking about? And he was thinking about this, right? So you have to ask, what role does monogenism, monogenism is the technical term for one couple, what does, it, what, what does it do in the Catholic theological synthesis? It explains one thing. It explains a common human nature. It's about Jesus. Everything in theology is about Jesus. Here's the thing. Jesus saved us, and I hope that some of you have discovered that deep down in your heart, that he is your savior, he, that your life has no meaning outside of that saving act. But Christians have affirmed that he has saved us by taking our human nature on himself. So the reason why we are saved, why our human nature is saved, because our Savior takes upon, the second person of the Trinity, takes upon himself a human nature. And then, as we will remember next week, he goes through his passion, he dies, he rises from the dead. And in doing so, he glorifies our nature in the eternal promise that you and I will rise from the dead. I always think that's gonna be good. I can't imagine what it'd be like, because I'm a biologist, but I'd love to be able to walk through walls one day. That would be incredibly cool. And because there would be so many things I could do that I can't do right now, like visit, I wanna see the black hole, the center of our galaxy, right? Sagittarius A, 33,000, I think it's three, thousand solar masses. We can't go there right now. My body will be crushed. But in the glorified body that I will have one day, I'll be able to go, let's go check that out. And I'm going to look at it and it, it will touch me because matter will have lost its hold on my spirit. Now this is the claim. This is the Christian claim. The Christian claim is that in a very real way, our bodies, because they were, because our nature was assumed by Christ and glorified with him, we too will be glorified. Now here's the problem. If your nature was not assumed by Christ, then you aren't saved. You see, that's the issue. And in 1950, when Pius XII wrote his encyclical, this is what biologists said. Biologists said, this is called the multi-regional theory. People from Asia were independently evolved from people from Africa who independently evolved from people from Europe. Now, our savior was Asian. He's a Semite. So if you are in Europe, his nature and your nature are different. That would be a huge problem theologically. Because that means that you're, if you are white Caucasian, you're not saved. Sorry. And so what has to happen, what has to happen is that the church is like, we, that certainly can't be true. That certainly can't be true. But now look at 2018. What I've shown you is that in 2018, we actually have common roots. So that the Savior who takes up his nature, he's Asian, the nature he takes up is the same nature that Africans have, the same natures that Europeans have, because we're all descended from this very small population of individuals in Africa. So you see that the science was different in 1950 as compared to 2018, which is why the church is able to say different things. The science and theology are always in conversation with each other, which is why in 2004, you notice these theologians will talk about a population of common genetic lineage. They'll talk about as individuals or in population. So the Catholic Church is open to the possibility that there were not just one Adam, but a group of people who were human as long as they have a common human nature that the, that the Savior would assume and redeem during, during his passion and glorious resurrection. Now, so this is the third question. We're talking about a shared human nature. And the thing is, whatever you say it has to be reconciled with the doctrine of original sin. So I'm going to end my talk by doing a lot of work to try to bring it all together. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to say there still was an Adam. We don't have to go 
where certain people want to go. I'm going to say there's an atom, and this is how I'm going to do it. I still think that it is reasonable to claim that there was a single historical original human being who is the universal ancestor of all of us. We can still defend Adam after Darwin. And I'd like to guide you through the thinking that supports this proposal. So, first, we need to distinguish Homo sapiens as a biological species from human beings as a natural kind. This is where we have to look at the philosophical presuppositions of biologists, and we ask, are they, is that accurate? And you have to understand that philosophically, we're not talking about biologically, <coughs> philosophically, biologists define Homo sapiens or any species by identifying a list of biological characteristics. So if I asked you, what's a human being? Uh, well, uh, especially an anthropologist, will list the, the, the size of the head, the cranium, the relative ratio, the upright posture. They're going to list all these characteristics, and they're going to say, if you have all these characteristics, you're a human. Now, here's a, uh, something that's really striking, though. When you propose a cluster theory to explain a species, you cannot have a single distinct historical moment when one thing becomes another. I like to illustrate that with this example. What is the English language? If I ask you to define the English language, give me the English language, define it for me, you're going to give me a list of things. You're just going to go, it has this syntax, it has that grammar, it has, and you're going to give me a list. If I ask you then, when did Middle English become Modern English? There's no one point in the evolution of language where you can say definitively, boom. Now, a lot of people say Shakespeare, but honestly, that's an ad hoc thing. That's just a cool place to begin because everyone agrees that Shakespeare was like the coolest English, I just say writer, in all of history. So why not say he is the originator of modern English? Anything be before him? Uh, is Middle English and even Ancient English and everything after, but it's ad hoc. It's ad hoc, right? And so we are not able then to distinguish one individual. But here's another way of approaching this question. The question is this. Let's look around us now. So we're not going to go back to history. We're going to look at us now and we're going to ask this. What trait, if any, distinguishes us now from every other living thing out there. Now this is, you and I may start thinking about this, but the ancient Greeks began this even before Christ, and they came up with this definition. A human being is a rational animal. And this is Boethius, He's, his account of a person. And a lot of people will say, what does that mean to be rational? Because I've had, I was saying this to the faculty and staff at lunch today. My students will say, Father, my dog thinks. And I'm like, yeah, your dog thinks, but your dog doesn't think like you. So we have to specify what thinking like us means. And it means to think in a non-computational way. Here's it, because a lot of people just assume that we are, our brains are like computers. And that one day, you're going to make a machine that thinks like us. And this was possible if the only thing we can do is computational thinking. But the ancients will say there's a special kind of thinking that is non-computational. It is insightful. It is grasping the concept. And the example I give is... When when I took a gap year between my undergraduate and my graduate work, I had the great privilege of being a fifth grade teacher in Bangkok, Thailand. I, it was Providence. I didn't choose that. It chose me. And one of the most difficult things I had to teach in math was to teach the concept of a half. Uh, fractions is really difficult for little kids who have never seen a fraction before in their life. How are you going to explain a half, even worse, a quarter? Teach that to someone with no clue. So what you had to do, what I had to do is, okay, I took 
a chocolate bar. This is half a chocolate bar. Put it right there in front of them. Pizza. That's half a pizza. And I took a glass of water and I poured it in. I said, that's half a glass of water. And my little kids are looking because they're trying to understand. Now notice, they're not doing one plus one equals two. What are you going to add? Subtract, nothing. They're just looking. And then little John Louis goes, oh, I got it. Now, he was 11 years old. He's now a banker in Hong Kong. But when he was 11, he grasped a half. I bet you he knows they're half now with all the money. At the <laughs> but he had to grasp a half for the first time. Now, his classmates were like, tell me, tell me. And then, blah, blah, blah. he can't. He can point. He goes, that's a half. That's a half. That's a half. That's a half. And what you see is that the universe, the concept of half is something you have to grasp. You have to get it or you don't. I can't calculate it. And Aquinas, Aristotle, the ancients say that kind of thinking. No dog will ever understand a quarter, a half, let alone something like justice or love. You know? So, so these are concepts. They can do things like food. They can do things like, I don't know, bone but they can't do the abstract. And this is where you and I have a unique capacity to do this kind of thinking. And my proposal is that this kind of thinking, this non-computational kind of thinking, is what happens in language. And so if you're to talk about a capacity that distinguishes us from every other thing, it's language. Now, a lot of people say, but father, squirrels talk to each other. My dog talks to me. So interesting. But um, <laughs> I'm going to say vocal communication is very different from language. You know, bird song is different from language because language, and this is the work of Noam Chomsky, the, pre the foremost linguistic at MIT, he will say language has a un human language has a unique capacity, and it's the capacity for merge. So I'm going to complain that I propose that the capacity for language is inherently tied to the capacity for abstraction, which is non-computational thought. And Thomas Aquinas will actually say this as well. I will not go into what he says. But, and so I will say that we are rational animals because we are also speaking primates. And I'm gonna rely on this incredible work that you should read, it was published only a couple of years ago. Why only us, language and evolution? And what is striking here is that Noam Chomsky will say that human language is defined by one property, this property of merge. And merge is non-hierarchical language. And you're like, what the heck is that? And the best way for me to do this is to show you what non-linear what non, non, what non hierarchical language looks like. Peter is too angry to eat. This is an English sentence. It has two meanings, right? The first meaning is Peter is too angry he can't eat. The other meaning is Peter is too angry I can't eat him. <laughs> and you see, ah, you see that is abstraction. You, it's the same thing with John Louis seeing a half. You have to see it. You have to see it. You have to be able to see that this one sentence has two meanings right on top of each other. And it turns out the reason we have two meanings is because uniquely to our species, and the, and the birds don't do this, is we can do hierarchical thinking. So hierarchical language. So when a bird does bird song, it goes A, B, C, D, E. And in fact, if you change the order, people do this because now we can just play, we can record, the bird song, and we can splice the different tunes, the birds get confused. They need it to be A, B, C, D. They can only have it in one linear order. But you and I have a capacity, because we have this non-computational thought, to think of this in two different ways. <coughs> By joining the phrasing in different ways. One of the things I propose to my students, I don't think we'll be able to complete to program a computer to understand this sentence in the way that you just understood it. 
because how are you going to tell, how are you going to program that computer to be able to do what you just did? You see, this is not a non-computational thing. Now, because the meaning, because if I said the pizza is too hot to eat, you would take it immediately as the pizza is too hot for me to eat. You would never say the pizza is too hot, it can't eat. So the exact same sentence, depending upon the meaning, is actually going to change how you understand it. Now, when we program things, we program things based on linear order. 1 plus 1 plus 1 and 0 is 1 and 0. So one of the challenges, if you try Google Translate, is that Google Translate is struggling to get the, the, the order right. But I'm proposing, and this is something that history will, will, is that you can't get the meaning, like something like this, where the meaning is exactly, is so different, but the, but the same exact wording has two separate meanings. What is Google Translate going to do? Right? It has no way of distinguishing this from this one meaning from the other. Now, what's striking is Noam Chomsky will say that the capacity for merge must have evolved and appeared in one person, and only one. He will say that in that 5,000, 10,000 hominins, one of them acquired the ability, a mutation, to learn, to do what you and I just did. Now, immediately as soon as you have that, you have an atom. Because Adam is the first speaking primate. Anything that went before him couldn't speak. Everything after him can speak. And since all of us can speak, we're all descended from Adam. Do you understand? Because if you don't have that mutation that he acquired, you would not, you would not be able to speak. And since every single human being on this planet today can speak, and can speak, you can take some little kid from Papua New Guinea, bring him to Cody, Wyoming, and within a couple of years, that little chatterbox is doing English, and vice versa. So human language, the capacity for language is in, is in biological. Um, one of the things that's so cool that I, I shared with the faculty at lunch today is that, of course, newborn babies cry in language-specific ways. So English babies of English moms cry in English with an English tune, and babies born of French moms will cry in a different way. You can compare the crying, and it depends upon, because basically the baby is listening to his mom speak in utero to prepare to acquire her language. So when he's born, the kid is already thinking English. There is an English cadence to his crying. That is amazing that the biological capacity for language is so rudimentary that the newborn is already using it in utero, that you can, you can measure it, you can, dis, you can figure it out the first day after his birth. And so, and so this is the biolinguistic account. The key here is that it appears only once. And so once you have clarified all this philosophical stuff, you can have a model for Adam and Eve, right? You want possible model. One possible account is that hominins evolved into these archaic humans over millions of years. But a single moment in time, a single person acquires this mutation. And the mutation can happen whichever way a biologist wishes to have it. But once that individual has that mutation, his brain changes. That's really what we think happens. The brain changes because of this mutation that allows that person to have the capacity for language. Now that person is a bona fide human being with a rational soul. Prior to that, the <coughs> rational soul, so I'm going to use philosophical language, the matter was not apt to receive the rational soul. At the moment of the mutation, you have that, and so you have a single individual, and that individual's offspring now think about it, right? That off, those offspring can speak. They are an amazing advantage to their non-speaking cousins because they can now band together. They can have team hunting teams. They can strategize. They can do things that non-speaking hominins would not have been able to do. So they would have outcompeted everybody else, and we're therefore descended from all of us. So to conclude the fourth question, you have to distinguish biological species from natural kinds. 
you have to talk about rationality, and I'm proposing the compa language capacity is associated with this, and the best biology suggests that it's one person who involves this, and this person would therefore be Adam. And since all of us today, including the savior of the world, was able to speak, we all share that nature. You see, it all, it keeps everything together. All the bits and pieces, the philosophy, the theology, and the biology, stay together in a way that's coherent and intelligible. So uh, this is the overall conclusions of my talk. I hope you can see that evolution can be reconciled with God, God working in the world. A lot of people struggle to see that. Evolutionary theory does not make monogenism, this is the account of one couple, untenable. However, you can still talk about an individual who evolved the capacity for language. He is the ancestor for all of us. And so evolutionary theory does not undermine the church's doctrine of original sin. And I've, I've worked on this in other areas talking about how God would have given us gifts to correct some of the evolutionary traits that we inherited from our ancestors. So that's it for the acknowledgement. Um, so uh, this question started off in a class. The reason why I think about Adam and Eve is because in the spring of 2012, when teaching an honors biology, uh, honors colloquium in science and religion, my students were asking me, like, Adam, Eve? I'm like, oh, let me think about this. So they asked me the questions that led to all of the thinking that I'm sharing with you today. This is Father Hyacinth Marie Cordell, one of my Dominican brothers. He's also an incredible drummist. But when he entered the Order of Preachers, he was a creationist. And so we had wonderful conversations. I had to learn to listen to him, try to figure out what, what his concerns were. And then I had to figure out ways to speak to him for him to understand it. He now is, he understands that evolution is actually a reasonable proposal to hold in conversation with Catholic theology. So he's okay now. But initially it was really, really, really hard because he couldn't put it all together in his mind. And so he challenged me He's one of his brothers to try to help him bring it, put it together. And then this is my own laboratory. So this is my lab. Day in and day out, they're the ones that ask me all the tough questions, usually at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because <laughs> when you're running a gel in the laboratory, and we have a wonderful Western civilization program, so all my students have to take SIV. So they all read Brothers Karamazov. They all read Dante. They read all of this stuff. And so while we're doing experiments, they have an opportunity to sit down and we just talk about Dante while doing, while, while tinkering with our genes. It's, it's kind of a way that you bring faith and science together in a very real lived way in the laboratory. So this is, this is my laboratory. I've been blessed with an amazing group of undergraduates at Providence College. This is the funding, especially the Biologos Foundation. They gave us money to try to use St. Thomas's thought to reconcile faith and reason. And so we came up with this website called www.themysticevolution.org. Here is a picture of Thomas Aquinas, and this is actually a diagram of the evolution of every living thing today. And so you get a, it's a contrast. In just one image, you see a contrast of Thomas and us. And we are down here, we are one of these little spikes. So it's been, it's been great to try to help to think through this, to help individuals who are struggling with faith and reason to begin to see that in incredibly unexpected ways, faith and science come together. Thank you very much for your kind attention.